So today I want to share a case with you that has some very subtle findings and if we can find these we're going to increase our skill and ability to perform and interpret an EFAST that may have significant clinical implications for us. So we see one of those in this first image here and another one in this image here. If you can't see that, that's okay. That's why I'm going over this and these are findings that I hope that all my residents that I work with and physicians I work with can find um, and I'm going to go over that today with you. Uh, these images have not been adjusted at all and are going to be the original images obtained in the exam. When we perform a clinical ultrasound, it's important that we always remember we're doing this with a very goal or focused, fo uh, focused function. So in this, uh, the key in an EFAST exam is we're looking for fluid and this can be in the thorax, uh, the pericardial space, or especially in the intraperitoneal space. And we're trying to determine if that fluid is present and if it could mean that they are hemorrhaging in such a way that they need uh, acute intervention. Also, we can get some supplementary information by looking for a, the cardiac function. Um, and also we can look for lung sliding, uh, which if present rules out a pneumothorax, at least in that location. So we're going to go through the images here real quick. I'm going to start with a right upper quadrant ultrasound. You've got some diagrams to the left to help you. So we see liver here really well. Uh, we can see the diaphragm here, and we're going to be looking in this area for hemorrhage. The nice thing is, is we don't really see the spine line here. This is probably aorta, so we might be fanned a little too far anterior. So. If you are not seeing this come down and connect and then no echoes or shadowing, um, just pay attention to that this may be aorta and you may be fanned too far anterior. We want to put our probe in the mid axillary line and fan posterior. We're going to get more of an image like this. Now this is the original image I shared with you. We do see the spine coming right up here and then notice right where the diaphragm would come together on the medial portion of the patient, we see the diaphragm continue. So this is a limited view and this may represent pathology. Why is it limited? Well, one, we can't see this area real well because we've not, we could increase the depth, which would help us. But the biggest issue is this rib shadows right over it and obscuring this. We do see what looks like uh, there is going to be pathology with this continuing. So that could be represented by free fluid in the thorax, uh, which would in a clinical trauma setting, we would be concerned for hemothorax. That could be just an effusion that's there chronically. This can be consolidation or atelectasis. Uh, this patient was intubated, so that would be concerned that it is either free fluid from the trauma or atelectasis from not ventilating the patient well enough. But what we'd wanna do is work in this area and look back up through here and try to improve that. We can do this by rotating the probe or, um, and I should say, and increasing the depth that may help us. So here's the first part that we want to see, um, but it's suggested that there's pathology given that we can see the spine line in that area. This is a great right upper quadrant. We're starting to see more of the hepatorenal space through here. We see the edge of the liver here. We're gonna look for this area to be the most sensitive for intraperitoneal free fluid. It does not look like there's any there, but there is what looks like maybe a rib right there. It's hard to tell, absolutely. Now we can go to another image. They imaged it really well right there. And fortunately, no signs of free fluid in the right upper quadrant, other than what we mentioned above the diaphragm. We're going to move to a subxiphoid view. We do see here um, that there is a lot of stomach gas here. And so we're not seeing the right ventricle or the apex of the heart very well. This is where fluid's going to typically collect is near, around that right ventricle. So what we can do is move the probe to the patient's right, if possible, in that subxiphoid region to better evaluate the heart. Um, they may have tried that when they obtained the second view because it does look like maybe they're getting a little more of the right ventricle. I would say, however, that you could not rule out pericardial sac free or fluid given that this is a limited view. What I would suggest is after you uh, finish imaging the other portion that you, or the rest of the exam, that you uh, switch to a cardiac or phased array probe and try obtaining a peristernal lung and see if that doesn't allow you to do it. Again, this patient's intubated. You could uh, do a nasogastric tube and suck this back, but that's not typically something you're gonna be waiting for while performing this exam. Uh, this is the view uh, that I mentioned that there's pathology and I'm not sure if you guys can see it there, but I hope you can. Um, this was originally missed um, and that's why we're going over it. But right here, I'm gonna zoom up over that. So this is the inferior tip of the spleen. It's the inferior and lateral portion. 
And what we can see, I'm going to take that off for a second, but what we can see is right here is this triangle. And the body doesn't like sharp angles. And so when we have that sharp angle there, that's going to indicate to us that it's fluid conforming to the space. So when we see that triangle and it's tapered like that, this, we need to pay attention to that because that is actually uh, free fluid in the left upper quadrant. So we're going to go to another view. Uh, nothing really telling there. We see a little bit more of the spleen, but we're also obscured by rib shadows. And then we come back and again, we're going to see that this is tapering in this area, a nice sharp angle here. Remember the body does not like those. And you can actually see that right here, there is still spleen. So they probably caught a portion of the splenic lac through here of what the patient of uh, where the patient was bleeding from. What we could do to improve this image, as you notice here, we're not getting above the spleen. So the poles of the spleen here and then it's going to be over in here is where fluid is typically going to first collect in the left upper quadrant and then it's going to go between the spleen and the diaphragm um, so if we look at this diagram here and i'm going to bring it up where we're going to typically see fluid is here and then here and we want to see fluid whether it comes up over it we got to keep in mind that fluid very seldom makes it between the spleen and the kidney um, if we come back to this, uh, we see fluid here and we don't see it here. That's very common. Not until the spleen is completely bathed in fluid will we see or fluid in this space. Now, even with a splenic injury, the right upper quadrant is still the most sensitive. This just happens to be an outlier where uh, we find fluid that was just in uh, this space here. And again, I think we found the laceration as that is penetrating into that and see this area here. So as we move on, um, we're going to move to the pelvic views. Uh, one thing I want to remind you is, especially as we look at the diagram to the right, the peritoneal cavity is not directly under the bladder like in this region. The peritoneal cavity is going to come down, go over the bladder, and then come through this part. So we're looking for free fluid along this posterior wall and in here. Um, that's important because that's one mistake I often see made by individuals. The other thing we could do to improve this image and the sensitivity of it because we're looking in this area is we need to decrease the far field gain or overall gain. You can see these, this artifact into the bladder and in this area and that tells you that your gain is too high. You could miss fluid back here or pelvic fl or intraperitoneal fluid in the suprapubic region because of this and this is called posterior acoustic enhancement just realize um, that we need to decrease our far field gain. Um, at least the American Board of Emergency Medicine, as part of the oral boards, um, is going to be having portions of this where you have to improve image quality. On this one, we could bring the overall gain down and especially bring it down here so that we have a more sensitive view and don't have all this artifact. Um, when we do a short access view, I'm not a big fan of the short access view in uh, the super pubic views. The reason why is we are actually looking when I'm going to jump back here is about this level. And so when we look at this level, you got to remember as we look at the diagram here, right? If we cut this through that level, we are never seeing the intraperitoneal cavity and we actually need to see above that. So I prefer the long access uh, like we have here. That's just a more sensitive view. And again, we're going to look on this posterior portion. And in this view, we're not looking uh, anything up into the intraperitoneal cavity, but only down into the pelvis, which we don't see fluid there very well. Uh, we have our lung views. Um, it's a good view. We can see the lung sliding back and forth along the pleural line. This is going to be obtained anteriorly. This one happens to be the right side. What we know is that in this spot, at least, there's not a pneumothorax. Now, we increase our sensitivity by the more rib spaces we evaluate. Uh, we know at least in this space though that there is a non-negative. In a supine patient, usually the dome of the chest is about nipple line. Um, the rib space is three to four. Uh, this is, we can place it here and look uh, for that sliding. When we go to the left side, we're going to see the same thing. We see lung sliding here. One thing we can do to really improve our view is uh, make sure we're not moving our hand around. There's probably a little bit of movement from both the patient and uh, the person performing the scan. I hope that's helpful to you to uh, further evaluate um, or get better at your clinical skills of interpreting a um, 
EFAST exam, uh, let me know any thoughts or comments below, or you can email me at pocusgeek at gmail.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you can be made aware of upcoming videos.